the slow passage of time on objects exposes these to all kinds of aggression. External agents and human activity act on them, damaging them, wearing them out, rusting them, rotting them. Water, fire, insects and microorganisms are together with man their fiercest enemies. What makes man different from the other forces is that they are the only ones who can stop or hold back the process which without their intervention would be irreversible. Scientific interest in art conservation has developed over the last century based on science and technology. The main criterion is that nothing that is external or foreign to the piece should be added. In those cases where it is essential to transgress this general principle, two requirements should be rigorously met. Whatever has been added should be clearly appreciated, and it should also be possible to remove it without this jeopardizing the integrity of the whole. Moreover, in many cases, it is necessary for the piece of work to recover its function and arrangement. These requirements are the result of the experience accumulated by curators who have learned that a piece of work is never definitively restored. Technical advances occur very quickly and respect for what could be done in the future makes restorers work cautiously so that their current intervention does not obstruct future restorations. The artworks and objects of cultural interest that fill the display cases of museums only represent a tiny fraction of human production over the years. They are not even representative of the total quantity of artworks that have been preserved up until our time. And that's because the majority of the world's artistic heritage is not on display. It is stored in security facilities, treasured for its commercial value, which does not always coincide with its value as an artwork. Safes, reinforced vaults and underground stores, protected against fire, flooding and earthquakes, hide thousands and thousands of pieces that were, at some moment, made for collective use and enjoyment. Thousands of treasures hidden from the light of day, which nonetheless need to be preserved. The scientific point of view has been so important in the development of criteria for artistic restoration that the need became clear to create specialized centers provided with the latest technologies to carry out this huge task. One of these centers is the Spanish Cultural Heritage Institute. Its radial architecture clearly expresses the convergence of the different branches of art and science that is its aim. The work carried out here is done based on the exchange of information among the different disciplines. A permanent dialogue between analysts and technicians by which, in the end, culture and art are strengthened. The teams of experts that work here are up to date with the most modern lines of research into techniques and science applied to the conservation of heritage. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required.
In the laboratories, analysis work is done that facilitates the work of curators and restorers at the center. Here, analysis is done on pigments, varnishes, glues, mortars, paper, wood, parchment, inks, metal, and other materials that man has learned to use to express his dreams. The electron microscope, dedicated exclusively to the field of art conservation, is essential for day-to-day -day work. Diving into the microscopic universe, the specialist curator can find out much of great interest when it comes to undertaking intervention. For example, it is possible to penetrate into the interior of the supports used by artists and to determine their nature with a high degree of accuracy. Using a tiny splinter extracted from the back of a painted board, it is possible to establish the kind of wood that the artist used as a support. The restoration process will proceed according to the outcome of this test. The center's documentation records are very important. A highly specialized library on artistic and technical matters allows information to be obtained beforehand for each project. A great many specialized books and journals are kept here. An extensive photographic library includes different archives, holding plates of great interest in terms of artistic heritage since photography began. Analyzing these plates, which are sometimes more than a century old, and comparing them with the work's current state, the curator can obtain crucial information when it comes to intervention. Faced with the challenge of deteriorating artworks, the curator can tackle conservation and restoration treatment in different ways. In some cases, and with some works like this Art Nouveau lamp from the beginning of the century, the aesthetic and decorative value is foremost, and so the piece must be treated, cleaned, and conserved to eliminate all the problems that might be present. In other cases, pieces may have a religious or cultural value, such as this terracotta, which comes from Ibiza, and which symbolizes a Punic tanier. This piece must be treated according to certain scientific and technical criteria, and the aim is to prepare it for exhibition and display. The analytical possibilities that the new exploration systems offer the curator provide him or her with a solid foundation on which to base his or her criteria for intervening in the work from the purely material point of view. Once the greatest possible amount of specific data about its material condition has been extracted from the piece, it is then analyzed as a human work. This means investigating the historical and personal circumstances of its creation with the aim of achieving an in-depth understanding of the object's essence. Then the conservator turns to technology for the intervention, paying attention to the general maxims of restoration, but never forgetting that each piece is different to others, and this requires individual treatment. X-rays show us what is hidden without damaging the surface, which makes them perfect for art restoration whose general criteria involve, above all, preserving the original. The Institute's radiology department contributes to the overall task with powerful equipment, able to work at a very high degree of penetration, which means that the room must be very well insulated. Here, work is done on pieces whose sizes and nature vary considerably, and the information that is extracted constitutes valuable material for those who will later undertake the intervention. 
The x-rays of large wooden sculptures, for example, reveal the presence in the interior of metallic elements, which may or may not be integral parts of the piece. On other occasions, what the x-rays show underneath the visible paint layer are not corrections or changes but complete works which, due to the extreme poverty of the artists, were reused as supports for new paintings. One of the most curious cases to have happened in this radiology department was the discovery that this work by Rizzi, St. Ignatius of Antioch, was made up of two hidden works, which radiation revealed to have been sewn together and then used for the new work. Spectral images that overlap, art that exists and which, at the same time, does not. X-rays are also used with extraordinary results to examine the contents of very ancient documents written on metallic supports that have become very corroded. This is the case with this bronze plaque, the support for a document that could be essential for further knowledge of the ancient Iberian language. The responsibility of the restorer of this document, with its great informative value, is lessened once the x-ray of the piece has been carried out. Even if the later cleaning techniques create confusion or loss of signs in the text, this is nonetheless preserved by the x-ray. Its words will be preserved for history. There is an ever-growing desire to make heritage conservation an obligation to bequeath to posterity those items that history has left to us. That is why the restorer needs to access all kinds of procedures, whether they are mechanical, chemical, or in the case of this piece, steam brushing, or the preparation of poultices or gels able to penetrate the most inaccessible cracks. Aware of the appearance of new techniques that can be applied to their work, restorers carry out cleaning using everything from lasers, able to discriminate between colors, to ultrasonic devices adapted from those used by dentists for dental cleaning. The Institute's Documents and Book Service has developed its own system for the cleaning and recovery of very carbonated lead seals which consists of occasional electrolysis using platinum electrodes and acidulated water. And this is completed with subsequent washing and the application of a synthetic resin to protect the metal surface. So the seals remain linked to the documents forming a protected hole that allows them to be consulted by scholars. This document has been seriously damaged by the chemical substances that make up the inks, which can have very diverse natures. Sometimes their acidic nature can burn the paper, acting as a support. However, there are occasions on which the acidity contributes to preserving the original writing instead of destroying it. This is the case with the information contained on the 17th century labels that appeared on the back of this set of panel paintings by Francisco Zubaran. Although a large part of the label has been lost, the ink burnt the paper and reached the surface of the wood, and the marks of the writing were imprinted on it. On the side entrance doors of the Sacrarium, he painted two angels in life-size, with censers in their hands, and in the corridor leading to the tidy parts of the Sacrarium, paintings of some clerics of this order can be seen in life-size, which are admirably carried out and very natural-looking with realistic expressions and excellent chiaroscuro. This is how an 18th century traveler describes these paintings, which made out part of the ensemble in the Casusian monastery of Jerez de la Frontera, until they were taken from where they hung and transferred to the Cadiz Museum. There is a mystery behind these works. They were designed as an ordered set 
and nobody took the trouble at the time to write down the arrangement. Now, thanks to the labels that have appeared on their backs, it has finally been possible to determine the arrangement and they can be correctly displayed. This fulfills another of the maxims of restoration. What has been conceived as a whole should be restored as such. The artistic importance of the Thurbaran ensemble has meant that restoration has been tackled in a particularly detailed and systematic manner. Contemporary critics wholeheartedly agree with the opinion of the traveler and they consider these works to be highly representative of the artist's expressive mature period. Subaran was 40 when he completed them and was at a crucial point in his career. Art restoration professionals are obliged to seek the support of whatever sciences may help to carry out their task in the best possible way. They must make decisions with full knowledge of what they are doing in order to avoid irreparable errors. This is why they draw up an overall analysis plan whose results will guide intervention. In this case, a paint sample was taken to establish the chemical nature of its components. This is a delicate operation that always damages the work. However, fortunately, the analytical capacity of a modern laboratory that specializes in artworks, like the Institute's chemistry department, does not require large samples. The operations that are carried out with the sample are no less delicate than its extraction. What is sought is to identify the nature of the different strata that make up the paint layer. And so it must be looked at side on. In order to make it possible to handle, the analyst puts it in a block of synthetic resin that will then be reduced to the point where the sample can be accessed. From this moment on, handling must be done extremely carefully, since the smallest error will mean an irreplaceable loss. For those who know how to look, the stratigraphic cutting of a layer of paint contains precious information about varnishes, pigments, primers and preparations. Magnified enough times, these samples reveal important data about the artist's way of working and preferences, and also about the successive versions that the work experienced over time. In this sample, the existence of a red repainted layer can be seen over the original strata. This is a valuable piece of information that, once known to the curator, helps to make decisions. Finally, a third sample shows evidence of the existence of a thick layer of oxidized varnish that distorts the original coloring of the work. However, what we see under the microscope is not enough when we want to know the chemical nature of the strata that make up the paint layer. This is crucially important information for those who are to intervene in the work, since incorrect treatment may cause interactions between the different chemical substances present and could badly damage the piece. A computerized analysis device is used for this and its results establish the nature of these sample's components. And so the products and processes most appropriate for its treatment are defined in such a way that the restorers can carry out their work safely. They now know that the elimination of the layers of oxidized varnish is possible and desirable and they act on this information.
The aid of X-rays is essential for an in-depth analysis of the works. With their help, the Institute's radiology service has fully studied the Subarans from the Hereth Monastery. By penetrating the successive layers of the paintings, a new universe of information about the creative process is revealed. The phases of this process are shown and parameters for comparison are set, covering what conclusions can be reached, both as regards the ensemble and each work in particular. It is too often forgotten that the paintings are not always works by a single artist. Many great master painters had workshops of helpers who took responsibility for the most routine and laborious tasks. Later on, the master intervened in order to complete or correct the work. Many of these interventions can be detected today with great accuracy thanks to radiology. The comparative analysis of these pieces allows the specialist to debate over the degree of intervention by the master Thubaran in each of these. Here, comparison is based on something as subtle as the type of brushstroke used by the artist, its uniformity, its vigor, its fluidity. It is also possible to ascertain the order followed when carrying out the painting. When we see the complete head of a bishop under a mitre, it is then possible to say that the head was painted whole to make the mitre fit more easily later on. In these details, a specialized analyst finds much informative material that sometimes completely refutes current theories. The artistic restorer also has available an exploration procedure that is similar to X-rays, although with the added advantage that safety measures are not needed to use it. Reflectography involves using infrared radiation to penetrate beyond the visible surface of the painting revealing the consecutive stages of creating the painting from the first sketch on the canvas. The information taken by curators with these explorations can be crucial for their work. Penetrating further and further into the work, it is possible to observe the preparatory drawings of the artist, often done with a charcoal. These lines show the initial idea, the one that the painter had about his work before starting it. These are embryonic marks which would later be followed to a greater or lesser extent by the artist in the creative process that followed. The treatments required by the conservation of contemporary artworks make up a separate chapter in the set of artistic conservation techniques. The institutions that specialize in this kind of works, like Madrid's Reina Sofia Museum, are obliged to respond dynamically to the demands that arise with the deterioration of very different materials that are all too often ephemeral. It is clear then that the details of art conservation cannot be built up into a system. This is an occasional task which only makes sense with respect to the specific work it is applied to.
It is neither a science nor a craft, but the result of a chain of considerations, the first of which is to respect the artistic object as the result of the artist's intention. The absolute liberalization of aesthetic criteria that occurred throughout the last century means that artists use all kinds of materials that were never before thought of as artistic supports. There is no limit that has not been transgressed. Back then, nobody thought that time would also act on those inflammatory and daring works, but time has passed. In this painting, the painter Benjamin Palencia introduced a number of elements into the traditional oil, like oak leaves and feathers, that had been lost from a number of areas. Before treatment, the aim was to reproduce the same materials that the artist had used. This was done with a series of samples that were aged in a laboratory chamber, and then a number of adhesives were tested out to see which was best before being applied. The conservation workshops of the Reina Sofia Museum have the necessary resources to meet different challenges. The works restored here are some of the most important in contemporary art. Consequently, its work methods integrate very advanced analytical systems and any technique that may be adapted to its restoration work, such as the settlement of the paint layer by applying heat using infrared rays. As for the workshop, the most modern techniques rub shoulders with other more traditional ones in accordance with the needs of each piece, since, once again, general rules must submit to the peculiarities of each piece of work. What is common to all cases is the need for information about their condition, and infrared reflectography decisively contributes to this. The working methods followed in the study of contemporary art are basically similar to those followed in the study of works from previous periods. However, it is necessary to bear in mind the unique nature of the work that is to be analyzed, and specifically the different materials used. It is surprising that artistic supports have varied so little over time. Although they used very different chemical substances, both Picasso and Dürer used canvas backings and oil paint to create their works. Likewise, both Dürer's and Picasso's works can be analyzed using the stratigraphic technique. Unlike other centers with more of a hierarchy, the decisions in this department are taken after each of the curators expresses and defends his or her opinion on the matter. These are often decisions on very specific matters. For example, this is the case with this mobile by Ángel Ferran called Mujer Hacendosa, with the members of the team debating over the suitability of replacing the hemp cord that joins the pieces with another one of similar characteristics or the alternative of strengthening and consolidating the original cord. The crux of the matter lies in establishing whether the cord as an object forms an essential part of the piece, or whether, on the other hand, it is only a necessary element because of its function, but its nature is irrelevant for the whole work. This Miro sculpture of cast bronze with welded iron bars was subjected to study for packaging since it was requested for an exhibition to stop it suffering damage, as has happened here with this small deformation. Other times the problems are very similar to those that occur with older works. For example, this polished sculpture by the magnificent sculptor Alberto, we encounter the problem of recovering the original patina, 
which must have been very similar to the one shown on this other similar sculpture. Curators of contemporary art often have the privilege to receive the best possible advice for the restoration of works, that given by the artists themselves, who in many cases are still alive and working. In cases where the painters are no longer alive, the family is requested to provide all the documentation possible, including notes, videos and photographs about the artist's way of working or the brands of paint used. Information that can be very valuable when it comes to restoration. The artists' responses to the restoration of their works is very different in each case. There are those who resist the idea of restoration and those who work closely with the curator, providing information about the materials used and the work system. This information is filed and it will be very useful for future interventions in that artist's works. Many of the works in the Reina Sofia Museum's collection are drawings and paintings on paper. The process of restoring this graphite and India ink drawing, a work by the painter Benjamin Palencia, has a number of stages. First, mechanical cleaning is done to remove surface dirt that has become stuck, and then tests are done with solvents of various kinds to eliminate the yellowish stains of some substance until one that works is found. After studying the specific conditions of the work, cleaning is carried out if necessary, following a laborious method that consists of the occasional application of minimal quantities of solvent using glass capillary tubes, or if not, the art object is worked on under a special hood that lasts until cleaning is complete. Anthropology is a science whose limits are as vague as people's lives. And anthropological museums are the results of the human urge to collect and analyze the information that humans ourselves produce. Here there are objects that were familiar to our parents, to our grandparents, worn utensils polished by contact with human skin, instruments that let us escape from cold, hunger, loneliness, tools that helped us make life more comfortable, companions on our species' long voyage through time, survivals. Without a rigorous order, an anthropology museum's stores would come to look like a giant auction house because of the great variety of its collections. These museums house objects from material life, together with another series of things that were collected, sound recordings, ethnographic documentation that shows us forms of everyday life and their development since the arrival of photography. This building was designed in the 60s as a museum of contemporary art. Those were economic boom times for Spain, and the building, which was planned and constructed in those years, was given the best of everything, as the magnitude and the complexity of these technical facilities show. Like the system to keep the building at specific levels of humidity and temperature. A system that was impressive for the period. Later, the Anthropology Museum, its basements and stores, filled up with a strange universe, an unusual collection of objects. A kind of huge antique shop with wares chosen at the time by expert eyes and scrupulously conserved since then. 
These pieces are completely different, able to teach us lessons about the richness of diversity. For a long time, the museum's cupboards stored collections of clothing and garments from very different social levels, places and periods. Regional costume, characteristic fabrics, crochet work, lace, silk, linen, whose restoration and conservation had to be attended to by the curator. Work with fabrics is always labor-intensive and requires great attention. In the fabric workshops, the curator had to find an answer to all the problems and needs, such as finding the inks that are closest to the color of the works on which intervention has been carried out. Washing which requires particular attention to the fabric or the poor stability of the fabric sinks. or to the examination and correction of the damage that affects large fabrics. For this last issue, the curator has a large light table with a grid structure which helps to line up the warp and weft of the material correctly, regardless of what fibers that fabric is made of. Fashions change, and this fact concerns not only clothing, but bodies too. Old clothing does not fit on modern mannequins, and so these must be rounded out a little before being used in the workshop. There is also much anthropological heritage made of leather, and this has a very important role in the workshops. Harnesses of different kinds for different purposes, whose careful examination and analysis provides new data about their history. Sometimes this information complements important aspects for anthropological work. The museum has another kind of piece that is not normally found displayed in a museum. Objects that are much closer to us and, like farm harnesses, knives or wooden spoons, show the complexity and diversity of human objects. It seems as if time has acted on these objects faster than it should have, or as if it had done so on us. In any case, the conservation of these familiar utensils is no small problem. Anthropology museums are good places to remember our childhood, or even better, the childhoods of different generations. A collection of toys able to delight young and old. Toys as innocent as the children who use them. Toys from other times, when everything was different, but those in which a new form of entertainment was beginning to be seen. One that was going to change the way of seeing the world. When cinematography appeared, it was hardly anything other than a toy. 
a fairground curiosity. But the expressive imagination and ambition of its pioneers soon set it on the road to being a new art form based on light and movement. When the sound was added to those first trembling images, the new form of expression became the most complete one of all. More than a century has passed since then, and cinema has produced hundreds of thousands of works. The passage of time on many of these has been merciless, and the world's film institutes like the Spanish National Film Institute have an ocean of celluloid on their hands, whose urgent conservation must be attended to. This is no easy task, because in cinema, work is not done on originals, but on copies. This is an art based on reproduction, and the material formerly used for the copies, nitrates, has a dangerous tendency to combust. In fact, they are true chemical bombs. The criteria of cinematographic restoration are permanently under debate. Against the general tendency of modern restoration which rejects anything added, some cinematographic curators maintain that cinema is a show and that interventions should be imitative in order not to distract from the film. It is important to know as much as possible about the work so as to know how to undertake the task, and this requires thorough systematic and patient study beforehand, like the work of an alchemist. Sometimes an old film can be subject to study for more than three years before a single still is taken. It can be the case that there are various versions, which are quite unalike for showing in different countries. It is common for years to pass before all the materials can be brought together, and finally the work of reconstruction from the original negative can get underway. In the sphere of cinematographic restoration, there are few who have contributed as much as Spanish director Juan Mariné. With hundreds of kilometers of recorded film to his name, he has spent many years attempting to perfect and conserve the art of celluloid at the Spanish National Film Institute. More than a restorer, Mariné has always been a keen researcher into new mechanisms and processes for the treatment of photographic material, an innovative imagination able to insist again and again on his ideas until they are carried out. Because when a reproduction of a film is made, it should not be similar to the original, but the same, identical, with no generation loss. As well as its work restoring film, the Spanish Film Institute has the responsibility of conserving cinematographic collections that hold more than 20,000 titles. This requires an enormous effort from the point of view of storage and of cataloguing all the roles of film. In principle, the film's materials have meant the division of the entire collection into two main groups. While the modern material acetate does not present any hazards, although it requires specific conditions of environmental stability and chemically neutral packaging, for the old nitrate materials, it has been necessary to create a specially designed stack following strict safety parameters. The special stack has a number of isolated cells, each one with its own automatic alarm systems and shaft for the removal of gases. The cells are kept at a constant temperature of 6 degrees centigrade and a relative humidity of 50%. Furthermore, the Film Institute is in charge of making copies on acetate of the vast majority of these explosive nitrate materials. Hora. 
In this way, it is possible to preserve the great and not so important works of art of our time for the knowledge and enjoyment of future generations. The creation and organization of an important new museum is a unique occasion for a global view of the many things that the art curator must consider. The thyssen bornemisza Museum is one of the great institutions of this kind, a pioneer in its day. Its extraordinary collection includes works from all periods and places, of all styles and all genre. It is a result of many years of selected acquisition in the international art market. Located on the Paseo del Prado in Madrid, opposite the legendary museum of the same name, it occupies the former Villa Hermosa Palace, built in the 18th century and modified many times since then. The thyssen bornemisza Museum's air conditioning is designed to hold the temperature at between 20 and 23 degrees centigrade, with a tolerance of more or less a degree, and a relative humidity of around 55%, with a tolerance of around 5%. To install the thyssen bornemisza collection in the palace, it was necessary to carry out detailed engineering and architectural studies with the aim of providing the old palace with the infrastructure it would need to display and conserve the works with the maximum guarantees of stability. The difference between the concepts of restoration and conservation is made clear here. Restoration is necessary for objects whose material existence is endangered due to the action of external agents over time. Conservation, on the other hand, focuses on achieving the best conditions possible for the artwork in such a way as the passage of time will never endanger the piece's integrity. Restoration means intervention, while conservation can be understood as constant vigilance. The Thyssen Museum's collections, which come from a modern private collection created using strict criteria regarding the quality and material state of the pieces, were already in good condition before the museum was founded. Therefore, the starting point was ideal for attending to the conservation of the collection in a uniform way. The restoration department focuses on the monitoring of the pieces and preventative conservation. Bearing in mind the factors that surround the work, this involves detecting which of them might cause damage in order to create barriers and solve anomalies. Due to the quality and variety of its collection, the museum receives many requests for displaying some of its pieces at large international exhibitions of the most varied kinds. In these cases, the conditions demanded by the center in terms of the transport and security of its pieces are necessarily very strict. Special reinforced watertight and fireproof packaging is made for each object, and the atmosphere within it is the same as the one in which the work is normally displayed. This packaging includes a number of sensors that allow the conditions inside to be known at all times, so that a situation endangering the work will be detected as soon as it arises. The same precautions are also extended to certain pieces displayed in the museum itself. In this way, all these marvels of world art seem to have a safe future for many, many years. Each piece is a word in the never-ending dictionary of history. And our commitment to these words is found rooted within the human condition. It is not a minor activity. 
it is the only path that we as a species have been given to fight against the untiring passage of time towards death and forgetfulness. The slow passage of time on objects exposes these to all kinds of aggression. External agents and human activity act on them, damaging them, wearing them out, rusting them, rotting them. Water, fire, insects and microorganisms are together with man their fiercest enemies. What makes man different from the other forces is that they are the only ones who can stop or hold back the process which without their intervention would be irreversible. Scientific interest in art conservation has developed over the last century based on science and technology. The main criterion is that nothing that is external or foreign to the piece should be added. In those cases where it is essential to transgress this general principle, two requirements should be rigorously met. Whatever has been added should be clearly appreciated, and it should also be possible to remove it without this jeopardizing the integrity of the whole. Moreover, in many cases, it is necessary for the piece of work to recover its function and arrangement. These requirements are the result of the experience accumulated by curators who have learned that a piece of work is never definitively restored. Technical advances occur very quickly and respect for what could be done in the future makes restorers work cautiously so that their current intervention does not obstruct future restorations. All religions are the source of artistic manifestations. Gods and demons of all classes have arisen and been forgotten over the course of time and been represented in aspects that are sometimes terrible and sometimes beautiful. In these artistic manifestations, humans have made use of the most varied elements. Symbols that come down through the centuries and which are repeated in places far from each other in time and space. Abstract forms such as this mysterious Polynesian funerary piece whose ultimate meaning is unknown, or this oriental idol that represents the god Atis. The relationship of man with the divine has been the origin of all kinds of objects, structures, arrangements and monuments. Coincidences that are often surprising take place when cult symbols are compared. The pre-Columbian indigenous Quimbaya who cast these pieces of gold, put a scepter topped by a spiral in the hand of their great priest. This piece is greatly reminiscent of those carried by those other great priests, the Catholic bishops, completely unknown to the Quimbaya. Every human being is a potential artist, and the irresistible need to express oneself has led us to use materials at hand in order to leave an imprint on time. An imprint that, once made, seems impossible to eliminate. The materials are those provided by nature in every period and place. Throughout time, artistic supports have varied, although somewhat less than you might suspect. Much of the world's pictorial heritage is being carried out in oil on canvas in such a way that the technical basis of the restoration and conservation of these materials can be arranged in general stages that make up a process. This piece is being worked on at the Spanish Cultural Heritage Institute. The curator must obtain greater knowledge about the piece's nature before tackling the first stage of work. 
laying down the pictorial surface in those areas where it is at risk of being lost. Japanese paper impregnated with a special glue is used and the curator also applies gentle heat locally. With the pictorial layer laid down, a deep cleaning process is carried out. First, a number of cleaning tests are carried out along the width of the picture's surface to evaluate the level of intervention required. The removal of possible repaints or the loss of pictorial material itself may give rise to a number of lacunas, which the restorer eliminates by means of a careful coating using plaster mixed with glue. With the layer of plaster leveled, an ideal paste is prepared for the application of watercolor which will mask the fault. In this way, a deliberate optical confusion is produced by the application of hatching and stippling techniques. The restorer traces a series of fine lines with the intention of confusing the spectator's eye chromatically. From a distance, intervention will not be perceived Although, like the stippling, it is quite clear when the picture is observed from close up. The restorer does not invent what is missing, but only masks it, so that the work is not affected when it is contemplated. This meets two fundamental rules, to ensure the intervention is reversible and to make sure what has been done is clear. When the watercolor has dried, the work is varnished again to guarantee that it is protected. Sometimes due to the deterioration of the canvas support, it must be completely relined. It is necessary to know first where the work is to be hung after restoration, since it is crucial to know the dampness or dryness conditions of the hall when choosing materials and the tension of the new lining. We visit a private restoration workshop, a place where the specialist works with greater freedom. Although this is not always the case. The type of intervention is the same as that carried out when dealing with a work belonging to an institution. The only difference is that an imitative reintegration is carried out. And this is documented in a report with the materials used always being reversible. The guarantee that the work meets the general rules of artistic conservation is nothing other than the restorer's professional conscience. As an artistic material, wood is the base of a religious imagery. The number of images that have been carved in wood over time is incalculable. The Institute's Sculpture Department, on receiving every new commission, carries out a detailed examination with the aim of diagnosing the general condition of the work and establishing the most suitable treatment. The first consideration to bear in mind is whether this is a museum piece or a sculpture displayed for worship. Images that no longer have this function and which are conserved in museums receive the same treatment as works of art. Parts that have disappeared are not replaced. Intervention is carried out on them when this is necessary to maintain their endangered integrity or to stop them deteriorating further with intervention aimed exclusively at consolidation and cleaning, avoiding any attempt at reintegration. On the other hand, images for worship must be complete, and so the restorer feels free to imitate and to add any missing parts, or any which are damaged, with the condition that the interventions are reversible.
human skill is the only possible way to reintegrate carvings. Specialists in this job have more of the sculptor about them than the technician, and the task is based above all on observation and common sense. Master carvers are those who can best carry out the kind of restoration demanded by the church for cult images. Work which represents a complete reintegration both of the carving and of its delicate polychromy. Stone has traditionally been one of the materials most used by man in his struggle against oblivion. From granite to alabaster, from limestone to basalt, sculptors have filled the world with their works. This Renaissance piece, which represents Peter of Castile in prayer, is being restored in the same room of the National Archaeological Museum in Madrid, where it is displayed to the public. It is not the first time it has been restored. In fact, the head is older than the body, which has lost the polychromy it once had, although it is still possible to find some slight remains. The work is cleaned and a reintegration process is carried out with synthetic resin, this being done in a way that is similar to hatching in pictorial restoration. The reintegration must be visible from close up, but must not be appreciable when the whole is viewed. The partial deterioration of large and impressive marble pieces often requires major reintegration. In these cases, the intention is to reconstruct the volume to recover the sensation of the hull and to facilitate display. The reintegrated parts are easily detected. One of the great debates regarding the stone sculpture restoration is that about the patina, whether this is an addition by the works artist to improve its appearance or for better conservation, or whether the patina is the effect caused by the passage of time on materials, corrosion, accumulated dirt, etc. From the point of view of the restoration, normally intervention is done on this patina created by the passage of time. There is no single criterion when deciding how much intervention is to be done. There are those who support aggressive intervention, a thorough cleaning of the material, and those with more conservative criteria, who do a superficial cleaning, conserving the patina as long as it is stable and is not causing problems, thus maintaining the idea of an ancient piece. The restorer decides in each case, with the help of advice, on the depth of application of each of the cleaning treatments. Gold is a material much appreciated by religions. It is a material that the medieval scribes and illuminators used a great deal to ennoble their works. Now those fine manuscripts on parchment have become an essential source of knowledge about the Middle Ages. Their restoration and conservation is carried out at the Cultural Heritage Institute. Parchment, which is calfskin that has been cleaned, scraped and stretched, is an extraordinarily durable material. Although it is also very sensitive to variations in humidity, it was used for centuries before paper was manufactured and became popular. 
beautiful works have been painted on it, such as the Missale Hispalensis from the 14th and 15th centuries in four volumes, which is being restored at the Institute. This work was created by hands that carried out this delicate work of shape and color, by hands that skillfully added gold to its decoration, but also suffered from more covetous hands, who mutilated it to sell separately many of its little treasures, such as its beautiful capital letters. In fact, as with many other works, it has been a victim of its own beauty. The process of working with this material is quite similar to the restoration of works on paper, but the support is different. Animal skin has very different characteristics to the conglomerate of vegetable fibers that is paper. Therefore, the different stages of restoring parchment demand hard work and manual skill from the specialists. The reintegration of lost materials must be done using patterns based on what is missing, whose edges are trimmed down to the level of the damaged original's edges which have also been trimmed. The final aim is to recover the book's function, re-establishing its original structure. The damage done by the hands of men is no greater than that caused by the elements. Fire has caused havoc with this wonderful miniature leaf with scenes of the passion that is part of a 16th century choir book. However, what remains is beautiful enough to merit the consolidation work that its curator carefully carries out. Institutional documents from other centuries were attached to seals made from different materials, gold, silver, lead. These seals now have great historical value and are subject to restoration work. Very worn wax seals, on the other hand, can be replaced with exact copies obtained from moulds taken from another copy of the same seal conserved in good condition. This shapeless and almost unidentifiable mass is a valuable manuscript that was rescued from a barricade during the Spanish Civil War after having suffered all kinds of brutal attacks. Even though it seemed an impossible task, the Institute's Books and Manuscripts Service set about recovering it. Of course, there was no way of replacing the lost parts, but at least the piece can be given back its good condition and the conserved parts can be stabilized. Books and manuscripts hold an important part of our collective memory. From the material point of view, a book is nothing other than a folded surface. It is necessary to bear this in mind to understand the magnitude of the task that faces the restorer. The pieces that reach the department have been victims of very different misfortunes, perhaps recovered from fires or floods, devoured by insects, colonized by fungi, or attacked by microbes. Without the detailed and patient work of this team, it would be necessary to give them up as irrecoverable. The criteria that are followed are absolute respect for the piece's originality, whoever created it its original structure, and of course, for its own history. In the case of books, the recovery process begins with the unbinding and numbering of the pages, which allows each of them to be handed individually. The subject of the work is reduced in this way to a support, paper, to which one of a number of liquid pigments in the form of inks were applied. The restorer's first consideration, then, is the conservation level of each of these two components and the interaction that the passage of time has produced between them. 
The stability of the inks determines whether the documents can be washed or whether dry treatment is necessary. In the first case, they are washed and dried before the second stage of the process occurs, the mechanical reintegration of the paper when it has suffered losses due to the action of external agents. It is necessary firstly to determine the characteristics of the paper to be used to fill in the losses in the original. Faithful to the criterion of making the restoration evident, the idea is to replace them with a material that is not identical, but nonetheless similar. First, a paste of paper pulp with similar characteristics to the original is made and then mixed in the right proportion with already pigmented papers until the exact tone is achieved. Then the sheet of paper is put into an ingenious mechanism that allows the mechanical reintegration of the original's missing areas with the prepared pulp. When each and every one of the pages that make up the book have been treated in this way, sometimes a special laminate is added to increase the strength of the ensemble, and the leaves are put together and rebound, giving the book back its functional nature. After a last check and the erasure of the control numbers, the book is ready to be returned to the shelf of the library from where it came. The Institute sometimes receives unusual materials, such as this anatomy textbook drawn by the Nobel laureate in medicine, Santiago Ramón y Cajal, for the classes that he gave at Zaragoza University. The sheets are done with a support of ordinary paper, of the kind used for wrapping. The material is coloured wax, and so washing it is not even considered. Coincidence allows us to observe an unusual image. Using a tool with a surgical appearance, the curator carries out something similar to the surgeon's work. However, what he does is to separate a fragment of the sheet in order to restructure the back, removing the old paste that caused wrinkles and tension, stopping the piece from relaxing. Every book is a different world. This restorer is working on a manuscript from 1389. The reintegration of this book could be done mechanically, but because of its texture and unique nature, it is done manually. In the case of an attack from book-eating creatures, a pulp is prepared with paper and cellulose glue that is put into the holes, and then dried with the spatula in lost areas and grafts, and to consolidate the edges, the manual reintegration is carried out with this manufactured paper, opening it, leaving the long fiber so that it can be attached, and has a good consistency for when it is joined to the original. However, the greatest peculiarity about this book is its content. This is a non-holograph manuscript of the Book of Good Love, written by Juan Ruiz, archpriest of Ita. The restorer holds one of the greatest monuments of Spanish medieval literature.
It is impossible to identify the time and place that man learned to melt down silica sand to make glass objects. But the Romans had a flourishing industry in this material, supported by a strong demand. Glass objects were once a luxury accessory. Although they later became popular as special recipients for holding liqueurs, perfumes and ointments, the fantasy of craftsmen had found in the plastic mass of melted sand a new vehicle for their works. Archaeological glass raises a series of specific problems for the curator. The surface of the object sometimes presents a kind of exfoliation in the form of iridescent scales, about whose removal there are opposing views. In the restoration workshops of the National Archaeological Museum in Madrid, these scales are removed as long as the general condition of the piece allows this. In this way, the idea is to recover its transparency. It seems impossible that these delicate bottles and containers have stayed intact for two millennia. But we should not forget that glass is a very hard material. Its passive resistance to time is great because it is a material that does not combine with other elements in nature. However, it is also a fragile material. When pieces appear with cracks that are not too large, the manual reintegration of the faults is carried out with synthetic resins that have been previously pigmented to give them the same color as the piece if necessary. The integration is carried out using a wax mold as a base and this is then given the finishing touch. Once more, the restorer has met the maxim that everything added to the original should be clearly appreciated as an addition. The first synthetic resins used were less stable than current ones. The reintegrated parts on this piece restored years ago have shrunk, endangering its integrity. It is a lesson about the degree of trust that should be put in new materials before testing their response to the passage of time. The curators of the American Museum in Madrid face the difficulty of attending to very different pieces, complementary in some ways to those on display at the National Archaeological Museum which are no less heterogeneous. Both worlds are found in this difference. Both used clay to make different volumes, often guided by the same needs of usefulness and beauty. This is how the Greeks did it. And the indigenous Peruvians from the Mochi culture, they did it this way. Among the mochi of Peru, the potters were always women. They and they only had the sacred task of modeling these funerary containers that had been found in graves or wakas. As happens with many aspects of the indigenous art, the religious or mythological basis of these pieces are unknown. It is not clear even whether those representing human heads are reliable portraits of the deceased. There are reasons to think the opposite if we bear in mind that some of them are identical. At the Archaeological Museum Ceramic Restoration Workshop, 
Work is done on very extensive remains that make up a select collection of the pieces found in Spain over the centuries. Some of them are found in such a fragmented state that it is necessary to first carry out delicate reconstruction work that is a lot like a puzzle. With the fragments in place, they are joined, forming ever larger sections. When all of them are together, it is clear what parts have been lost, and these missing areas can be reintegrated. Then the pieces to be added are polished and covered with a layer of color similar to that of the work, but maintaining a clear difference that identifies the restoration. Ceramics in very different states reach the museum. There is ceramic that arrives fresh from the archaeological site, in which case the problems are the removal of earth and salt stuck to the piece or its fragmentation. The mineral salts, which can sometimes completely cover the original decoration, must be identified using reagents before they are removed. The other kind of ceramic that arrives already has restoration from different periods made using different criteria, simple restorations using simple glues that fit within the current lines of the restoration and very complete phases of reintegration that even cover the original piece in order to pretend that it has never been in a fragmented state, because sometimes the integrity of the piece was prized more than the piece's value. This is the case with this Greek vessel painted by a great Athenian artist totally covered with a black paste to hide the fragmentation and theoretically increase its market value at the end of the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century. Clay was one of the first materials used by humans to meet their needs and to express their beliefs. This piece, unique in its genre, is a Celto-Iberian necklace made of ceramic, to which its discoverer wanted to associate profound cosmological content. According to him, it was a kind of representation of the world. The scientific expeditions of the 18th century went to the most remote countries in search of information and returned to Europe with their stores full of strange objects that they would later catalogue and study. These were objects that arrived from lands whose cultures were unknown and which without any context would be as difficult to interpret as if they came from another planet. The only thing known about this curious piece is that it probably came from one of the voyages of exploration to the islands of Oceania. It is made of mother of pearl and wood, elements that are perfectly coherent with its place of origin. Fortunately, old prints still survive from which it is possible to know something more. This illustration from the voyages of Captain Cook shows a scene of the funerary rites of the Pacific Islands. The body appears on a platform, Tupapu, and in front of it, there is a person with a similar piece. Therefore, as has happened on so many other occasions, the object has survived beyond what it was made for. And now we have the symbol, but we do not know the most important thing, the meaning it had for those who used it.
An example of restoration of a whole is that of this unusual votive or ritual piece found in Piquillazca, 20 kilometers from Cuzco in Peru. We know nothing about the ultimate meaning of this curious structure. Each of its 40 figures is different from the others, but it also has elements of the others. They are carved in turquoise, and some have seen in it the representation of a founding rite, where the different powers of a mysterious pre-Inca society are shown. In this world, everything is restored. Even the world is restored. In the 17th century, the first representations of the planet became popular both for educational purposes and to adorn the studies of the learned and enlightened people. These 17th century globes are being restored at the National Archaeological Museum, although they were restored more than 100 years ago. This earth pairs up with another showing a map of the heavens, with the main zodiacal and circumpolar constellations being very easy to recognize. The spheres are made of wood or card with a representation of the world painted or printed on paper attached. The pieces are mounted on a support and supported by a horizontal band showing the degrees of longitude. The use of these objects has contributed more to damaging them than any other factor. The uncountable times that a hand has rested on them to turn them has dirted them profoundly and put them off their axis. The intervention has been limited to a surface cleaning, the removal of repaint and then the application of a protective layer. This astrolab restored in the Department of Books and Documents at the Cultural Heritage Institute is an extremely interesting piece. This is an educational instrument to introduce students into the secrets of using it. The restorer must consider different alternatives when facing such a complex piece. The references were painted on paper and for them to be cleaned correctly, it would be necessary to lift it and then put it back again. But the paper surface is not one piece. Rather, it is made of several that must later be adjusted meticulously. In the end, the decision is made to clean the surface of the paper without removing it. The metallurgical techniques of the new world have surprising aspects as shown by the collection of gold figures from the Kimbaya culture at the America Museum, which have revealed some of these aspects. Gold has never been abundant. The Quimbaya, who thrived in what is now Colombia between the 7th and 11th centuries of our era, found a way of making gold go much further. Their funerary figures seem to have been recently removed from a metal polisher. The appearance could not be more dazzling. However, all that glitters is not gold. The Kumbaya understood the techniques of metallurgy very well, and they developed a technique called Tumbaga. It was the treatment of a plating with a very low gold content, 8 or 10 percent, which, treated with vegetable acids, urine and then fire, corroded and eliminated the non-precious metals, leaving the surface covered in the precious metal. With a final polish, they obtained a surface that was completely golden, as if the piece were made of solid gold. In old Europe, the treatment of metals goes back much further. Bronze, a metal which in a free state tends to combine with other elements, is subject to progressive and irreversible damage, which can result in complete mineralization and disintegration. Bronze surfaces develop oxides, carbonates, and very dangerous chlorides, which activate in the presence of humidity, however clean the metallic surface is. These chlorides are responsible for the complete loss of many ancient bronze pieces.
Often, the statues require major intervention to show the fragments remaining from the hull in a coherent way. It is necessary to reconstitute large areas that have disappeared to hold the original remains. In these cases, the reintegrated parts should be particularly clear and they must fulfill the function of being mere structural supports. Bronze objects can give us a great deal of information. Metal treatment techniques allow a number of them to be combined, making them an expressive vehicle. This sculpture represents the oriental god Atis, and it was perhaps brought to Spain by Roman legionaries. It has gone through a process of partial reintegration, and during the last cleaning, yellow decoration along its trousers appeared, and so it received the popular name of the Mariachi Singer. In terms of iron, a raw material for tools and especially weapons, its main enemy is rust, which triggers the same process in iron as chlorine does in bronze. Unfortunately, the processes by which iron mineralizes are much more active, and so the archaeological discovery of iron usually supplies little information. Iron requires robust intervention, which does not give good results, since the surface alterations due to oxidization are normally so serious that every trace of decoration is destroyed, unless it has been carried out in combination with more resistant metals, like silver. Regarding archaeological iron objects, we should learn to be content to have an approximate idea of its exterior shape. It is better not to strengthen twisted objects because the loss of the metallic core could be so serious that the piece, lacking flexibility, would break up into a thousand pieces if it was subject to pressure. Perhaps in the future, it'll be possible to undertake this enterprise with certain guarantees, but not for now. Compared with the treatment of metals, the conservation of especially delicate materials such as feathers demands very different criteria. Feather art is a particularly subtle world in which only a few specialists in the world act with confidence. Were those merely whims, those combinations of color and shape that make up these headdresses, those sometimes beautiful and sometimes disconcerting adornments? Or perhaps their selection and combination was part of a mysterious language, an accumulation of esoteric references that only the initiated could interpret? In any case, the feather art curator's task demands the same respect for the original piece as any other. Here we are dealing with three-dimensional structures with attachments that are very different. Joined together with frames, tar or vegetable fibers, most of these pieces are very old. Some have been discarded in drawers in studies and storerooms for centuries. Their current state shows that behind an apparent fragility, they hide an impressive power to survive.
Museums also hold certain very special materials. Materials that curators limit themselves to attempting to keep intact for fear that they disintegrate in their hands. This Peruvian mummy comes from Paracas in the central Andes, and it is probably more than 2,000 years old, corresponding to the early intermediate period. Its magnificent state of conservation is surprising, as is that of the decorations it was buried with. Its necklaces and chest decorations shine, as do the gold adornments. The mantle is very rich, and it is adorned with symbolic and geometric motifs, whose meaning has been lost to us. The information that a scientific analysis of this piece will provide for those who undertake it will be extraordinary. Together with the mummy, a bag with an interesting trousseau appeared, and so it is suspected that this was a person with a connection to the work of spinning and fabrics. Perhaps it was she herself who created the rich vestments that are on display at the American Museum. One of the most unusual pieces to be restored is this human head, shrunken by the Hibaro Indians. This peculiarity of the tribe was a kind of security system. The intruder would have to think twice before invading Hibaro territory. The head is empty inside, and its state of conservation is excellent. The Hibaros made work that lasted. Another head removed from its body, that of Medusa, whose gaze, according to myth, turned to stone anyone who met it. Now it is she who is converted into stone. In the thousands of small stones and tesserae that make up this Roman mosaic exhibited at the National Archaeological Museum. Mosaics do not normally appear complete. Their integrity depends on the conservation of all their pieces and on the firmness of the support they are attached to. When some go missing, their neighbors notice and tend to loosen and come off and so the lost surface gets larger and larger. Reintegration is possible if the lacunas are not excessive or do not affect large areas of the mosaic. In other cases, any possible reintegration is rejected since the information has been lost forever. Therefore, it is necessary to accept the fact that most antique mosaics appear incomplete. In the Americas, the mosaics were made of feathers. The Christianized indigenous inhabitants learned to use this feather art, using this delicate labor to represent religious iconography. The saints and virgins that are subject to the greatest prestige and devotion in their churches were reproduced naively, or they followed the same patterns as Catholic iconography, tracing prints that were alien to their own cultural roots. Work was also done in the Americas on mother-of-pearl mosaics, in which the inlay of this material was alternated with paint. The skill of this delicate work is surprising, and it was used to represent all kinds of sacred scenes, images and miracles, but also heroic scenes from the history of the conquest.
This technique flourished in Mexico at the end of the 17th century and never became a popular art, but was very localized. The best collection is conserved in the stores of Madrid's America Museum. The syncretism of these modest pieces makes clear the inevitable dialogue that religious art has constantly kept up within itself, over and above the apparent differences of beliefs and cults. The love of art drives us to conservation. Man protects and testifies to his own memory in this way, increasing self-knowledge, and this enriches him. The work of conservation leads us to recover the colors and forms of the past, returning them to the present. More evidence of the human need to struggle against death. The slow passage of time on objects exposes these to all kinds of aggression. External agents and human activity act on them, damaging them, wearing them out, rusting them, rotting them. Water, fire, insects and microorganisms are together with man their fiercest enemies. What makes man different from the other forces is that they are the only ones who can stop or hold back the process which, with other intervention, would be irreversible. Scientific interest in art conservation has developed over the last century based on science and technology. The main criterion is that nothing that is external or foreign to the piece should be added. In those cases where it is essential to transgress this general principle, two requirements should be rigorously met. Whatever has been added should be clearly appreciated and it should also be possible to remove it without this jeopardizing the integrity of the whole. Moreover, in many cases, it is necessary for the piece of work to recover its function and arrangement. These requirements are the result of the experience accumulated by curators who have learned that a piece of work is never definitively restored. Technical advances occur very quickly, and respect for what could be done in the future makes restorers work cautiously so that their current intervention does not obstruct future restorations. Grand official buildings are historical scenarios and are both the symbols and the showcases of nations. We must fix our vision on what real peace would bring. Peace, after all, means not just avoiding war and the costs of preparing for it. Bienvenidos a Madrid, bienvenidos a España, convertidas hoy con su presencia en capital y patria de la esperanza de paz. The halls of these buildings are the scene of events which affect us all. Sometimes they are even privileged enough to witness the signing of treaties which constitute the first building blocks of a fragile peace. The area where the Royal Palace in Madrid now stands has been a center of power since the earliest times. But the first stone for the building which stands here today was laid only two and a half centuries ago, and this palace replaced an old one built by the Austrian dynasty which fell victim to fire. 
This enormous building and everything which it contains is a very important part of the Spanish National Trust. The Spanish National Trust deals with the state heritage which is at the disposal of the crown. This great group of palaces and monasteries also contains some splendid and valuable collections of artworks. All these works are at the disposal and service of His Majesty the King so that he can carry out state functions and they are also at the service of all people as a permanent conveyor of our culture. All these riches and this heritage from our history demand constant care, protection and restoration so that they remain in perfect condition. For this reason, the National Trust has a number of workshops where the necessary restoration can be carried out. Here we are entering the very heart of the palace, the throne room. The throne room is spacious, but it is neither arrogant nor imposing in its dimensions, and was designed by the educated and prudent monarch Charles III. The symbols with which it is decorated reflect more than anything else the character of the monarch who occupied the throne at the time. Around the throne itself, the four theological virtues are represented prudence, justice, strength, and moderation, fit companions for one who wielded absolute power. The wish to maintain the palace as a living building demands constant effort from all those who are responsible for its care and maintenance. The enormous number of works of art held within its walls and their high quality and historical value mean that the conditions under which their conservation is carried out have to be constantly monitored. There are kilometers of halls and rooms full of stuccos, drapes, gilded objects, tapestries, clocks, porcelain, chandeliers, mirrors, furniture, pictures and carpets, which have to be kept in perfect condition in spite of the hundreds of tourists and the additional enormous effort needed for their conservation which this implies. There is one particular part of the National Trust which consists of all the halls of the palace where state functions are held, the presentation of credentials, state banquets, audiences, and this means that it is not only necessary to restore the room itself, but to restore it so that it can be used, since it is not the same thing to keep a work of art in a glass case as to keep it in a hall in the very place where it was intended to be displayed. The vast range of different materials and objects with which the restoration studios of the palace faced requires a small army of specialists who are fully acquainted with the technical details and production processes long forgotten or abandoned over the years. And they also need to know about materials which are no longer in current use at the beginning of the 21st century. In some cases, the old traditions cannot be learned from books but are handed down from generation to generation. This is the case with the Toboso family who have worked in the palace for generations. In the workshops of the studios, modern techniques are used for the treatment of various pieces. Ultrasonic techniques, for example, are used for the cleaning of delicate surfaces.
The collection contained in the Royal Armoury is priceless from a purely historical point of view, as well as on account of the precision of the different mechanisms. Specialists first turn to documentation contained in the archives, where even the smallest details of each weapon are recorded before beginning any restoration. A vast range of restoration techniques are employed since many different objects from different places have been collected over the years. These pieces, on account of the decorations which have been applied, are truly unique. Embossed with coral, mother of pearl, and precious stones, they seem more like jewels or personal adornments than firearms. The furniture in the palace, which encompasses several different eras and styles, is the responsibility of the joinery and upholstery department, and it is here that the necessary adjustments and repairs are carried out to keep the furniture in good condition. But the various different departments scarcely ever operate in isolation since many works of restoration draw on several different areas of expertise. In an environment like a palace, each individual piece also forms a part of and is understood within the context of the general decoration and architecture dictated by a particular historical style. One important area in the upkeep of the palace as a whole is the restoration of the gilded surfaces, which cover some hundreds of square meters. Gilders work using traditional techniques, which incorporate knowledge acquired over centuries. Machines are unable to duplicate their ability to manually handle and apply the fine gold leaf. From the point of view of restoration, the most important thing in this room is the old upholstery, which has to be cleaned and kept in a textile depository so that it is available for researchers. But in order to be able to use the room again in its original form, it is necessary to re-upholster it with cloth of the same kind as that which exists now. The restoration of large upholstered surfaces has to be accomplished in such a way that the building is in a perfect state and can continue to be used. But in the textile workshop in the palace, work is also undertaken on other types of pieces and research is constantly being carried out. There are also numerous ceramic pieces in the palace.
quite apart from the valuable individual ceramic objects placed in rooms and on tables, there are whole rooms where the decoration is based on ceramic reliefs. Palace in Madrid also contains many other exceptional artifacts amongst its treasures. The section for gold artifacts includes some very remarkable pieces, as well as some unusual miniature and whimsical decorative articles like this circular alabaster shrine made during the first third of the 19th century. Reliquaries designed to hold the remains of martyrs and saints were also in most cases made of precious metals. This nativity scene made from wood, coral, silver, copper and brass during the first half of the 16th century is an exquisite and delicate piece of work. Each piece has its own history and forms an integral part of the group. This jewel case belonging to Isabel II is a miniature safe. It is very easy to open when you know how, but if not, it would be a challenge to a thief even today. Then there are the clocks. The hands have turned for centuries and they have been witness to the rhythms of war and peace, to weddings and funerals, and to joys and sorrows. These are pieces which move and even have a voice. monuments to the skills of the clockmakers, and their precision movements are only fully appreciated when the moment comes to restore them. There are clocks of all different kinds, decorated in all different ways. They are in turn ornamental, scientific, coquettish, solemn, precisely accurate and pretentious. There are planetary clocks, astral clocks and clocks reflecting the stars, all ceaselessly marking the passage of time. The Trust, of course, has a painting studio as well, although most of the Spanish royal collection was transferred to the Prado Museum when it was first established. The part of the collection which now hangs on the palace walls portrays previous occupants of the building, former kings and queens who seem to be saying farewell to the groups of tourists who have completed their visit to this amazing collection of curious and wonderful objects. Very few of them are aware of the efforts being carried out daily to preserve and look after what they have just seen. There are places in the world where it is clear that more lies behind what is immediately visible. Places where a special silence reigns, where the word has a special meaning.
The library in El Escorial on the outskirts of Madrid is one of these special magnetic places. Conversations overheard in this room have without a doubt brought something invisible to it, a certain sensitivity, since from its very creation this room was intended to be a spiritual point, with a certain spirituality which is not necessarily linked to that of religion. It was in this room that the world was analyzed, for this was the center of activity of the Spanish Empire at a time when the sun did not set within its bounds. The very best brains of the Catholic world, who were philosophers, geographers, astronomers, alchemists, or who sometimes combined all disciplines, used the library in El Escorial as their base and as the source of information. A veneer of doubts and certainties, of wisdom and ignorance, of beliefs and mistakes, gives these objects their own personality in that they have witnessed the efforts of human intelligence to come to terms with the world in which it finds itself. The Monastery of El Escorial, considered to be the eighth wonder of the world, is on the outskirts of Madrid. Its conservation also falls to the National Trust and in total it is many times larger than the Royal Palace in Madrid. A high price in terms of restoration must be paid to keep the building alive and open to visitors. The lower part of these frescoes, for example, which is within reach of visitors, has been restored. But we are not talking about a modern problem, since they are also graffiti which date back to the 8th century. Attempts were made to protect it with glass panels, but tourists push coins between the glass and the wall and cause considerable damage to the painting. When one considers El Escorial, it seems that it is endless. Room after room follow on in endless succession. Restoration work here is monumental, for the simple reason that the monastery itself is so huge and imperial. For Spain, the 16th century was the high point in its entire history, and El Escorial is the perfect embodiment of the importance of the age. Its straight, clean lines reflect the severity of Castile, and were it not for the addition of some color and embellishment, it would look very ominous. This is why the religious frescoes were originally introduced, and they represent the best paintings of this type of their time. This was not the first time that they have undergone restoration. They have always been within the reach of visitors, and some people have felt the necessity to leave some mark of their visit, to scratch a desperate record of their existence as the years flowed by. It is a very human temptation, and after all, even the artists themselves let their own mark behind. Finally, their time came for the marks to disappear in the hands of the restorers who have made every effort to return these maltreated painted surfaces to their original brilliance and freshness. The scratches which have marks on them are first stuccoed and then hidden with color. A hushed music seems to descend from the empirical scene, a solemn symphony, the noise of stirring bodies congregating around the glory of the Spanish monarch in the 16th century. Fortunately, no one has managed to reach the magnificent paintings which decorate the ceiling of the principal staircase. They are too high up and they give the impression of being even higher. This place, which is huge and bare, is so impressive that it seems to have a paralyzing effect.
The various works of restoration which were carried out in El Escorial were not independent of one another. There was an overall concept of restoring the grandiose building in its entirety. Situated as it is in the mountains north of Madrid, it has been subjected to a mountain climate for centuries. And although the fabric of the building, which is made of granite, is not in danger, the passing of time has had some effect on some of the patios and roofs. The greatest restoration efforts in the monastery concentrated in the so-called Sala de Batallas, or Hall of Battles. According to some tapestries which were discovered centuries later in the palace at Segovia, Tabarone, Cambiezo, Granello and Castillo began the paintings here in 1585. There is evidence of 16 quite extensive restorations since the 17th century. For this restoration, the 17th, they estimated that it would be necessary to employ a team of 10 specialists for a period of three and a half years. But it was hard to estimate with any precision since in this kind of work time can be multiplied two to five times as unforeseen circumstances crop up during the course of the process. The real problems which are likely to arise cannot be identified until the conservation work begins and only then can the restorer have any idea of the extent of the work which faces him. The battle against persistent humidity, the discovery of original paintings underneath repainted areas, as well as other possible surprises of this magnitude or even greater magnitude, all serve to make the restorer cautious and any prior estimates are couched with reservations. The painting of a fresco also made its own demands in terms of timing. The artists who carried it out began preparing the plaster many months in advance, and any decision which was made in a hurry could well have had bad repercussions for work carried out in the Hall of Battles. As for the frescoes themselves, the detailed work which the painting requires and the criteria of modern restoration meant that a meticulous regatino art should be used instead of traditional repainting, and this made the work of the restorer very much more complicated. But on the other hand, it meant that the restoration of the work and its authenticity was far better than any previous work carried out in the Hall of Battles. But why is it called the Hall of Battles? Perhaps because power always needs a reminder that it must overcome other powers in order to survive. Sometimes it even needs to overcome its own power. Here, power confronts power. Lance confronts lance. Helmet confronts helmet. Just like warring rams following some atavistic impulse and multiplying the tombs of the dead. Cannons, banners waving in the wind, polished armor violently shining in the sun, spurs digging into the horse's flanks, the steel of crossbows, unbelievable wounds, shouts of rage and of anguish, the desperate neighing of horses, implacable cavalry squadrons opening up a route through ranks of infantry like a combine harvester moving through the grain fields. These men, however, have faith in what they are doing. They are the defenders of the king, of the faith, of the pope, and of the fatherland. They sense the weight of history and they go into combat willingly and with determination. What else could make them lift up their arms if not conviction? It was complete conviction which made them wield their swords, and complete conviction which led to so many committed dead men. El Escorial is a surprising mix of love and violence. 
because it was built as a result of spiritualism combined with power. It is not a beautiful building, but it was never intended to be so. It is awesome and attracts and terrifies at one and the same time. It is not amenable, but severe. It is distant and unwelcoming, but remains aloof. Nothing could be more alien to our own time and our own customs than these imposing walls which offer no sanctuary. This construction of straight lines which does not make the slightest concession. These angles and borders which seem to want to purify thought and faith until they become pure abstract geometry. But even so, it has an awesome beauty of its own. At the beginning of the 13th century, the city of Burgos was the seat of the court of Castile. And in 1221, the first stone was laid of what would become one of the most beautiful cathedrals in the Catholic world. Now, almost eight centuries later, its delicate structures are still standing and bear witness to the zeal and dedication of its builders. But time has taken its toll and only timely intervention to restore the building has put a stop to further deterioration. The scaffolding which was erected around it to carry out the restoration gave the church a curiously modern appearance and the Gothic cathedral lied hidden behind what looked like an office building. The square constructions which mask the delicate patterns of its towers also serve to highlight the harmonious proportions of the original building. Any attempt to restore these stone needles which are covered with sculpted reliefs is an enormous undertaking. Especially when one realizes that this is not a task which is limited to the surfaces of the structure, but which goes deep into the structure itself. The surface of the cathedral had been affected by the passage of time. Accumulated dirt over the centuries had concentrated in those areas which escaped naturally being washed off by the rain. And at these points, the surface of the stone had reacted with the chemical agents which had fallen on it. The result was a progressive deterioration of the surface which had caused successive layers of stone to break away and which could in the end destroy the stone completely. This was the reason for the leprous effect on certain parts, parts which were once intricately carved and polished. Preliminary research precedes any restoration work. It is imperative to know in detail how the microprocesses which are taking place in the stone have come about. Just like hospital patients, these reliefs yield data through sensitive instruments which will later be carefully analyzed by specialists. The whole monument was threatened by deterioration and the anxious specialists undertook extensive studies of the general condition of the whole church and discovered that the two needles were in greatest danger since they were originally constructed of stone openwork to save weight. Deterioration of the towers of the cathedral in Burgos is divided into three distinct types. The inevitable aging of the material of which they are made, the effect of the level of industrialization of contemporary society, and the damage caused by man. In the towers, unlike the rest of the cathedral, the effects of pollution have been minimal since they stand over 80 meters above ground. But man has had a negative effect on the towers. In the 30s, a metal structure was introduced to support the bells and the staircase leading up to the balcony on top of the tower. But the structure was completely independent from the tower itself. A lack of knowledge in the 60s led to this metal structure being concreted to the stone of the towers themselves. The corrosion of the metal structure over the years produced a wave effect which caused the stone towers to crack and some cracks now measure more than four centimeters. The solution has been to micro-sew the cracks together, 
but in particular to isolate the negative influence which the metal structure was having through the concrete by making the two structures independent of one another. One of the towers has already been restored and the scaffolding has been removed and it is possible to see the detail which the cleaning process has revealed such as these fine carvings all along the edge of the structure. The stonemasons knew that their work would not be visible from the ground but this in no way affected the quality of their work. Work on surfaces as complex as these has to be very precisely planned and the exact measurement of each one of the thousands of elements which make up the pattern was calculated and recorded. A supplementary technique known as photometrics is of great assistance in the restoration of buildings. The photometrics department of the Spanish Institute of Historical Heritage can provide plans by using pairs of photographs taken with special cameras, which are linked to precise topographical points. Plates are put into an optical apparatus called a restorer, where a stereoscopic image of the monument is generated, which the operator can interpret using both his hands and his feet. The results are read by an automatic design machine which transfers the various operations onto paper. The relationship which exists between the distance between various parts of the building and their size is therefore mathematically guaranteed. The restored image can be generated to an appropriate scale for the subsequent work of restoring the monument. The resulting plans are an insurance for the future in the conservation of these architectural treasures, since they ensure that any future work will be carried out with complete precision. The vault of the dome of the cathedral at Burgos is a reminder that it is on the inside that the building really comes into its own. The interior of the cathedral is even more impressive than the exterior. On the walls and the internal structures, stone has been transformed into figures, flowers and swords. A petrified world full of messages and symbols, stone filigree erected by and in the service of Christianity. The church as the owner of these architectural jewels has been dedicated to their conservation since the very beginning. And there is even an ecclesiastical post which reflects this task, that of the church warden that is as old as the cathedrals themselves. He is appointed by the chapter and is in charge of all works carried out within the cathedral, is responsible for identifying all the needs of the building and is especially responsible for the conservation of the building itself, as well as of all the artifacts which the building contains. The interior restoration of the cathedral's chapels turned the church into a forest of scaffolding, a three-dimensional spider's web which the restorer had to learn to navigate with ease. Platforms on different levels allowed access to the highest areas, right up into the heavens.
Restorers were thus able to reach parts of the cathedral which had not been seen since the building was constructed. But everywhere, even in hidden recesses, there was the same striving for perfection and the same careful attention to detail. There are two kilometers of reliefs like these, for example, in this chapel alone. Detailed restoration provides an opportunity to study in depth some of the little-known aspects of the construction techniques and the sculpture of the Middle Ages. And the more that is learned, the more surprises there are in store. It is clear that cathedrals offer much more than they appear to do so at first sight. And there is still much more to be learned. Not very long after America was discovered, the admirals from Castile decided to endow the Cathedral of Burgos with something that later would be considered one of the best ornamental groups of religious art that were carried out at that time. Five centuries later, the altarpieces that composed what was called Condestable Chapel were dismantled for its restoration in the same cathedral enclosure. The complexity of this intervention can be judged by the state and the quality of the sizes that once restored, they should adjust to each other with the precision of a clockwork mechanism. During the process, the director of the restoration was forced to take very radical decisions. One of them was to make copies of the most important pieces in the group that would replace the original ones when the altarpiece was installed again. That way, the originals would be exhibited so that the public would have occasion of appreciating close up the extraordinary quality that up until now went unnoticed due to the high places where the pieces were. This decision had another reason not less justified. It allowed, for example, to maintain original pieces in more appropriate environmental conditions and safe from new attacks of xylophag insects. On the other hand, the decision respected a basic rule. All these copies could be replaced again by their originals whenever this was required. It is essential to insist on making the extraordinary effort that involves this work on these masterpieces of medieval and Renaissance carving. To finance all this effort, it was necessary to obtain the support of private individuals and entities. Society can also contribute with an effective way to the best conservation and restoration of monuments, and very especially of the wealth contained inside these big cathedrals. The exhibition of the imagery of the Condestable Chapel's altarpieces is an example of this action shared between associations and institutions and a result that one can achieve with these kind of procedures. In the Condestable Chapel, there is not only one altarpiece, but several that include exceptional pieces as the Santa Ana triplex of Gil de Siloe. Mm. 
of this nativity original of his son, Diego de Siloe, with serious deteriorations in the boy's figure. Or the elegant angel of the announcement painted by Felipe de Vigarni. The average quality of the pieces is really extraordinary. And so are the strange symbols they sometimes have. Like in the case of this singular piece known as the synagogue, whose gloomy force is still more accentuated by the curious circumstance that the xylophage insects chose to attack the most dramatic area in the carving. It is very remarkable that most of these sacred sculptures appear sustaining books in their hands. The books certainly are also sacred, and the artist's scruple wrote on their pages, even knowing that, due to its position on the altar place, the detail could not be appreciated. People who are in daily contact with this national heritage carry out the vital service of both watching over it and educating others about it. But they obviously cannot carry out all the work themselves. They need the help of specialists to tackle large works of art like this one. This is one of the largest works by Claudio Coelho and was made in 1668. It was actually made in situ and then placed on this wall. The whole altarpiece was built around it afterwards and that is why it is so difficult to restore. These are polychromes which were lifted up in pans and fixed with steam. There have been several attempts at restoration over recent years and above all one attempt which was the worst of all during the 19th century which has been totally removed. The original colors used by Claudio Coelho can now be seen in all their glory, just as he intended. The resources seem quite limited when one considers the enormous amount of work required to maintain the vast quantity of statues, carvings, porticos, friezes, columns and paintings, which are all part of the national heritage. Many of these pieces portray scenes from the past which together provide valuable information for understanding the past centuries and which may seem very prolific judging from the extraordinary heritage they have left us. <laughs> 